This video is sponsored by me. Hello everyone, Adam here, and welcome to the second episode of my Replica ISS series. This episode focuses on Unity, the first module to be connected to the FGB core, and was launched via Space Shuttle, so you folks will be introduced to my new rendition of that. For anyone with keen eyes, you will notice that I removed the shuttle's radiators that I was going to include, as it turns out not to be compatible with all payloads. The Kraken has them now. I also added a breaking ground cannon arm. However, unless you're really into realism, I do recommend just docking the old fashioned way still. One false move will result in full Kraken strike, but this option is there for any who dare use it. Remember that this project is sponsored and created by myself, so if you like the craft files, please do become a Patreon. If you enjoyed these premieres, please do hit the join button. And if you like my coffee cup, and please do check out the merch store. Don't forget, as long as you have both DLCs installed for Kerbal Space Program, you can download and build along with me. Patreon's getting early access, of course. I've also been making Tony Bella inspired infographics to accompany each craft file. They take longer to create than I care to admit, so please do let me know what you think of them in the comments below. Also, here's an extra shout out to the KSP community. Some of you, like Snackless Kerbal, or Dave, or Sky Phoenix as I call him, noticed the Grookus hashtag I started on Twitter and used it to share their ISS inspired replicas. So make sure you get in on that action too if you are building or have built a replica international space station using Kerbal Space Program. Right, I think we are about ready to show you the next part of the ISS construction process, but before we get into that, we have a message incoming all the way from Tasmania, Australia. Down the ladder now. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. I just wanted to say a big thanks to Adam for taking on the task of rebuilding the International Space Station in Kerbal Space Program for all of us to enjoy. You can probably tell already that this is going to be a really wild ride and knowing Adam, he is going to ensure that even the likes of myself will be learning all sorts of details about this venture that have been overlooked or since forgotten. So remember to like and subscribe to this content. Good luck to you, mate. I really enjoyed the first episode that you did and I can't wait for you to get stuck into the next one. So without further ado, let's check out Adam's Node 1 Unity montage. All is going well for launch this morning as NASA prepares for the first of many visits to the International Space Station. Hello to pressurization. And final pressurization of the liquid oxygen tank located inside the external tank is underway. Everything continues to look good and we are cleared for launch today. No problems are being reported from the vehicle or the crew. OTC, PLT, caution warning cleared, non expected. Hey, copy, and endeavor to close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow. You have a very exciting mission ahead of you. We wish you maximum success. success. Endeavor, Roger. Thanks a lot. PLS is so free. O2 pressurization. All systems are go. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. We have a go for main engine start. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour with the first American element of the International Space Station uniting our efforts in space to achieve our common goal. Roll pull down.
boost rocks are confirming a good separation of the twin solid rockets. Endeavour's speed now 3,200 miles per hour as it moves into its second stage, three main engines. Endeavour, your performance is nominal, you are two engine maroon. Performance nominal, two engine maroon. They call indicating that uh, all performance uh, for the spacecraft right on target, all is property normally. Altitude now 42 miles, 61 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. Endeavour, your single engine press 104. Single engine press 104. Endeavour can now reach its planned orbit on only one engine if needed. All three engines operating well at full throttle. Altitude 65 miles. Endeavour speed now 13,000 miles per hour. 580 miles northeast of the Kennedy Space Center. Three engines on Endeavour now throttling back to prevent the spacecraft from experiencing forces in excess of three times that of Earth's gravity. Speed now 15,000 miles per hour. Endeavour, you're a nominal Miko. No ohms one required. We copy. Nominal Miko. No ohms one required. Boost officer confirms the jettison of the external fuel tank. Endeavour Houston, we will delay the ET photo maneuver to MET 1430. Copy, delay the ET photo maneuver to MET 1430. Good copy. Here's main engine cutoff, you can see a stopwatch floating by and flashes out the window are the 800 pound reaction control jets firing to uh, move us away from the tank and maintain our attitude. And a, a great shot of the external tank, you get a real sense of speed as we track the external tank over the Pyrenees here, going a little better than five miles a second over the ground. get onto orbit and the first thing that we have to do is to open up the payload bay doors so that we can start cooling all of the electronics inside the orbiter. It also gave us our first really nice view of Unity. On the second day of the flight, we went ahead and checked out the shuttle's robotic arm to make sure it was operating fully. And the shuttle's robotic arm worked just great. It uh, flew identically to the way that our simulators fly. These are the snares closing. That's the manner in which we grappled And then on flight day three, it was time to extract Unity from the payload bay. It was uh, wedged in there pretty good. We had a fairly limited clearance to bring it out of the base. And the whole operation uh, took about an hour and a half to maneuver it up and then onto the orbiter docking system that you saw on the forward portion of the payload bay. And uh, we just flew the arm very slowly. And uh, Jim was great help being my assistant and letting me know how quickly we were moving the payload. We then uh, pitched it up about 90 degrees, rotated it around to align it properly with the orbiter docking system. And the unique thing about uh, mating these components is we actually didn't use the arm to bring it all the way down onto the orbiter docking system. We took it so it was six inches apart, and then we fired the thrusters on board the shuttle to provide the closure rate necessary. Nancy did an outstanding job pulling the uh payload out of the payload bay, Unity, uh, couldn't have done it better. Very smooth and controlled and precise. She had less than an inch of clearance on either side as she brought it up. She was pretty happy when everything turned out right. Approach Zarya from 600 feet underneath it. Everybody's taking pictures. There's uh, Jim using the handheld laser to uh, get an accurate uh, distance from it. And uh, here's a computer view of our profile as we flew it in. We 
use the laptop computers to uh, help us better understand orbital mechanics because it's not always intuitive. The rendezvous was uh, absolutely fantastic to see Zarya, which means sunrise in Russian, uh, out on the horizon as we closed in on it uh, for our capture. What a beautiful sight. Final grapple and uh, proximity operations were done at night. You can see it's starting to get darker there, but the uh, orbit payload bays and the cameras we have allow us to uh, light it up so that we can see it well. This is a view from the end of the robotic arm and the camera located on it, and this view is now actually from the Russian module Zarya looking down on the arm as it comes into grapple. We actually didn't have that view in the cockpit. and. Uh, so it was quite a unique experience to know that the ground was looking over our shoulder literally as we came in for the grapple. So we brought it down right over that grapple fixture, that long pin, and closed the snares that you saw in the earlier version uh, to attain the uh, grapple and rigidization process uh, required to maneuver Zari around. Uh, we were very, very happy uh, after we grappled this 45,000 pound free flyer uh, after Bob had literally flown formation with it at Mach 25. And then it was time to install Zarya on top of Unity. Again, uh, we were operating almost at the limit of the robotic arm because the uh, Unity module extended about 40 feet out of the payload bay. And so the arm was almost fully extended as we brought Zarya up and over Unity into the install position. We actually couldn't see the mating surface where it was going to mate, so we had to use cameras alone. This is the elbow camera view. And again, we fired the thruster to attain that capture sequence with the uh, androgynous uh, positioning mechanism. Just a really nice view of the space station docked to uh, Endeavour out the overhead window. Uh, Zarya with the orbiter docking station, just like we dock with Mir Space Station. Once pulled together, we have a solid mating surface. We drive the hooks and uh, can pressurize it uh, so we can go inside. Here you see Rick and uh, Sergey as they're opening up the hatch that goes from the mid deck or living volume of the space shuttle back into a tunnel that leads to the airlock where our spacesuits were stowed and what we used to go in and out of the space shuttle on our three spacewalks. Here we are in the mid-deck, Jim on the right and myself on the left as we're uh, demonstrating in space that you can put your, both your legs into your pants at the same time in zero gravity. Uh, after I got my pants on, I went into the airlock to start getting into the rest of the suit and here's Jim finishing his suit up and going back through the tunnel to the airlock to get into the upper half of his spacesuit. And put our helmets on and then go through a check out of the suits and a free breathe to hope to make sure that we didn't have any problems with uh, the bends. And then when that was all completed, it was time to go outside and start our task. Here's the, uh, the cracking of the egg as uh, Jerry opens up the thermal cover and begins uh, the first spacewalk. We went right to work. We uh, had one crew member that was normally working on the end of the arm and a foot restraint that we had attached there. And the other crew member normally did most of his work in a free float manner, uh, holding on to the sides of the orbiter and space station as he did his work. Uh, the most important part of the first spacewalk was the connection of 40 different electrical connectors that allowed all the communications and control signals to be transferred between the various different elements of the station and also importantly the electrical power to be transferred from Zarya down to the Unity module so that we could start to activate all the systems inside the US built Unity module. After the completion of the first spacewalk, we then activated the space station from inside and actually turned on the computers and uh, electrical power to it, and what a great moment that was. After that, we boosted the space station to a higher altitude using the uh, Plus X RCS jets on the orbiter. Uh, each one of those jets gives about 800 pounds of thrust and through a uh, firing sequence that required a lot of analysis so we didn't break the space station. You can see it oscillating back and forth here after one of the firings. Uh, we boosted it uh, approximately 8 nautical miles with 11 firings. A uh, little oscillation in one of the solar arrays there. It was 2 minutes and 10 seconds between firings and that all damped out uh, before we did the next one. 
Okay, on the second spacewalk, it was my turn to go outside first. There were antennas that the Russians had expected to have deployed, but which did not employ one on each side. So Jerry and I each on two different spacewalks took this boat hook and encouraged the antennas uh, to deploy. It turns out they just needed a little nudge. The antenna was a coiled um, metal on a spool. And don't blink here and there goes the spool. So with uh, activating and deploying that antenna, now the uh, Russian Toru system, which is a manual backup to their docking capability, would be uh, fully operational. At this point of the flight, uh, we had a space station that was ready to go inside, and we began our first day of uh, docked operations with actual ingress into the space station. And what a highlight of the mission, to see everybody's hard work come to fruition. Uh, been a long time coming but to go inside the space station for the first time was really exciting. Here we are opening the hatch, uh, going from the orbiter docking station on into the pressurized mating adapter tube. Kind of like the, uh, the front porch of the space station here. And then opening the main hatch into Unity. And uh, Zarya means sunrise in Russian. And of course, Unity uh, is binding us all together. It's the connecting piece which which holds all the other modules from the space station. It was a, a very bright, roomy, and nice place to be. It uh, was quite a sequence to go through all the uh, checks that we had to before making sure it was safe that we could open the hatch, making sure the pressure was correct on both sides. Uh, after. Progressing on, we went through PMA-1 in the first compartment of uh, the FGB of Zarya, and then opening the hatch into the main compartment of Zarya. The purpose of the FGB is to provide the initial electrical power and flight control for the early stages of the space station. Here we are, all inside uh, Zarya, for the very first conference from the space station. Sergei Krikalev, our Russian crew member, uh, will actually be going up to live on the space station with Bill Shepard and Yuri Gudzinko. And he's checking out his uh, new home here, future home. Uh, Sergei has over a year's space flight experience uh, on the Mir space station. And as you can see, he readily adapted to uh, microgravity and being home on this module. Watch how effortlessly he translates down to the other end. very nice place to be, uh, more of a corridor than anything else, not meant for uh, living. We also had to remove a lot of uh, structural panels and bolts that were put in specifically so that the modules could withstand the loads at launch. And we wanted to remove those to make uh, accessibility behind the panels easier. So we ended up bringing back about 800 bolts and nuts and washers back from the space station. We had to pinch ourselves every time we looked out the overhead window. It was just uh, hard to believe that we were docked to a new International Space Station. Kind of take you on a little tour as we uh, transit through the mid-deck access hatch. Uh, here you can see Jim down on the mid-deck. Rick's bringing back some stuff that had been removed from the space station for shipment home to Houston. Again, transiting through uh, the hatch into the tunnel that connects to the airlock. We now go up through the upper hatch of the airlock into the pressurized mating adapter and then down into Unity. Jerry and Nancy reviewing procedures uh, into uh, pressurized mating adapter one and here comes Sergey into the first uh, compartment of Zarya. Again, you can see the ducting that we installed and finally into the, uh, the main compartment. The sad points of the mission was when we closed the hatch on the space station after being aboard for two days. Uh, it was really, we wanted to stay longer. It was a great place to be. Here we are checking out one of the uh, simplified aid for EVA rescue, a little jet backpack uh, before the, the third uh, EVA. One of the 
primary task of uh, this space walk was to add a very large bag, about three feet on a side, to the outside of the station, which contains a lot of tools which will be used by future crews in the assembly process of the station. We finished off our operations on the stack of the station and then had the opportunity to do a flight test of the rescue backpack. We identified a couple of uh, problems that we're going to fix uh, and we'll have a fully functional satisfactory way for a crew member to save themselves should they become detached from the structure of the station. Here was a pretty sight, seeing the space station uh, attached to uh, Endeavour, but uh, then came the point in the mission where we had to uh, separate and uh, prepare to come home. And uh, this uh, next sequence of shots uh, again highlights all the teamwork on this crew that really went into almost every event. Uh, there were at least two of us, and uh, you'll be able to see here as uh, we separate right there from PMA-2 from the orbiter docking system and begin to uh, back away. When we get to two feet, then uh, I'll put in some out pulses, which will uh, cause Endeavour to uh, fly away from the International Space Station. Rick was at the uh, flight controls at the aft uh, flight deck for this portion of the mission and flew Endeavour away from the space station out to uh, a distance of 450 feet and then flew around it one and a half times and he did an outstanding job. As the uh, sun came up it was very bright in the cockpit and uh, fortunately uh, the experienced crew members uh, warned me that it would be necessary to have sunglasses. There's Nancy at the front inputting the orbiter attitudes. Jerry is uh, closing out the docking system, performing the final uh, steps to secure that. And uh, Jim was assisting with the computers and taking uh, handheld laser marks. That shows the uh, empty payload bay. Uh, the mission wasn't by any means over yet. We still had work to do. And uh, the next thing we had to do was deploy uh, SAC A, which was the first uh, successfully launched Argentinian built satellite. It has a number of small uh, different experiments and uh, new technologies which are being proven from Argentina. And they had a slight mutation as it came out of the can that quickly uh, stabilized. No uh, crew movie would be complete without some shots of the crew living on orbit. As I said, the, the mid-deck is where we live and eat and sleep. And here you can see uh, the crew grabbing a bite to eat. Food is a very important part of life uh, on orbit as anywhere else. And uh, here you can see uh, me preparing some spaghetti and rehydrating it. Uh, all the uh, food during our flight was very delicious. Computers are a, a great aid to us. Uh, Nancy typing away, sending letters, and uh, Jim with his juggling app. Here's uh, Sergey with a, a ball of water showing the unique property that fluids have in a microgravity environment. This was our second uh, hitchhiker satellite we deployed. It's Mighty Sat. It was built at Phillips Lab in uh, Kirtland Air Force Base, New Mexico. It's also doing uh, very well. And then there's always a sad moment when it's time to close the doors. As the doors come shut, you realize that it's really time to pack your bags to enjoy perhaps one last sunset before getting into those suits and preparing the flight deck for re-entry, where we've taken a rocket and turned it into an on-orbiting uh, spaceship, and we're taking our spaceship and turning it into a glider to uh, where uh, the commander and the pilot, Bob and Rick, and uh, gonna get us home now. Look how funny. This is right at cutoff. Endeavor, good burn, no trip required.
Now as we re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, we have those special tiles that keep us from burning up. Otherwise, uh, we'd be a, a, just a brief uh, shooting star. But as it is, it, we do create a plasma behind us, which you can see here pulsing. And it's so bright that as it flashes and pulses, it flashes inside the cabin. And you can see out the window also that every once in a while there'll be a little shower of sparks. And I always sort of wonder what that was. Approach and land. Endeavor, you're on the top. Wind 3205 gust tip. Endeavor, roger. 8,000. 5,000 radar. Roger, radar. Checks good on one and two. This is a view out the uh, heads up display on the pilot side. Uh, same as the commanders. Uh, coming down for a touchdown on runway 15 at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, our touchdown speed is about 195 knots. A beautiful night shot of Endeavour as we come into the brightness of the xenon lights, uh, touching down on speed on center line. Uh, we didn't have a drag chute. At this gross weight, in, uh, with the brakes as good as they are, it was not required to have a, a drag chute for our flight. For a reunion, there's uh, Jim Lovell and uh, Gene Cernan, and there's a, a really happy crew after an outstanding mission. But this is only the beginning of the International Space Station and we've got a long way to go uh, when it's done and it truly will be the brightest new star on the horizon. Here's a pretty cool place. This is sort of like in your house where everybody meets in the morning. Uh, after you wash your face, brush your teeth, you want to find something for breakfast. And this is our kitchen. You might notice there's all sorts of foods here. Uh, it's like opening the refrigerator. You got all your different stuff that you want to have. Drinks, meats, eggs, vegetables, cereals, uh, bread, uh, snacks. And that's a good place. That's where you find all the candy. Uh, side dishes and then some little power bars just in case. So we have all this type of food. Some of it is dehydrated, and so we have to hydrate it, fill it up with water. Some of it is all ready made, and then all we have to do is heat it up. So something like this, I'm pulling out barbecued beef brisket. Pretty yummy. Not only is this food made in the US, but we also have food here from Japan. Uh, we've got Russian food. As you can see, all these red containers are filled with food that's from Russia. Um, and then we get some of our specialty stuff, some things that we like, some of our favorite stuff that your family can send up. In fact, I like fluffernutters, and so I got sent up some fluff so I could make my fluffernutter with peanut butter. Up here is where the meat packages are. Usually we want to heat something up. These are the type of things you heat up. These are our meats. Throw that in the heater. And then about 10 minutes later, you can eat it. If you look over here, this is our uh, our table. Now, really, when we eat, it's more like I think we prepare here. We really don't eat on the table here because there's no reason to eat on a table. So, what we'll do is we'll help prepare things here, keep things stuck to the Velcro or the tape as we need it to. And then, when we want to eat, though, you're actually just holding it here and uh, uh, let it float or eat it to do what you need to do while you eat. And uh, as we sit around here, if we want to throw on something on a, uh, a movie on or something to watch uh, during the, uh, while we're eating. So we don't have to talk to each other, that's all it's been told. And uh, we'll do that right here, those we do it. This right here is our food warmer. Uh, so uh, we take the packets of food, go ahead, throw them in here, heat them up. And uh, this is actually the art of the week. So we're getting uh, pictures from uh, the, the kids of people who work on the ground force, the ground team, which we truly appreciate. We have their kids send us a picture every week. Of, uh, of art, so it's like refrigerator art. Uh, we put it on our heater here because we really don't have a refrigerator right here. So we use that and then we have a new one each week on there. Besides that, we have more storage here, here, all the way around. You can also tell the color. If you look around here, it's kind of interesting how it uh, used to be white, but after uh, over 10 years of people living on this thing, uh, or over 10 years for sure, uh, it's got a little stain. And that's one thing about eating up here. 
is uh, it's a mess. Every time you open the package, and as you think about it at home, when you, you open the package, you pull it to open, what you're actually right here, you're doing, you're putting energy into this package, and it squeezes up and it goes boom, and it pops. When it pops, things come flying out. And sometimes you contain it, sometimes you don't. And uh, hence, we got uh, stains everywhere. Oh yeah, this is maybe interesting. This is a barcode reader. So whenever we have something uh, deployed, be it uh, a T-shirt, tissues, or whatever, and, uh, then with the barcode reader we can let the system know where we took it from and uh, where it goes. And then, because it's a big station with a lot of items, uh, this way the ground and, and, our, and we ourselves we know uh, where uh, we left something might be a week, it might be half a year uh, before that somebody used it and nobody knows that where it is from memory, so we need this system. We're going to take those two modules and add a service module for living and even more modules as the space station continues to grow into a, a world-class microgravity lab that's in space 24 hours a day, 365 days a year doing science.